Um, welcome everyone. I'm thrilled that it looks like there's 52 participants. Um, I hope you can hear me fine. Um, I was once a professional storyteller. I did that for many years and um, haven't done it as much lately, but I still love telling stories and I'm especially captivated by the stories of our beloved native plants. I'm gonna start out the presentation. If you wanna to go to the next screen, Joan. It's coming, there we go. There we go. Um, so in 2017, the city of San Antonio put a call out for people to write poems to celebrate the tricentennial. And they ended up selecting 30 poems to create a poetry book to celebrate the tricentennial. And my poem, Honey Mesquite Dreams the People is in that collection. And so I'm gonna start out actually with a poem. And this is a poem in which I imagine the honey mesquite telling its own story and how it drew the first peoples in this region and offered its gifts. Honey mesquite dreams the people. The summer drone of chicharas ripens my pods, sugary green like their thrumming bodies. My seed cases dry to raspy brown, streaked with ruby, hue of sweet tunas thrust from the pads of prickly pear cacti. My taproot plunges deep, seeks a pathway through limestone to hidden waters. I taste Cretaceous chalks, skeletal remains of coccoliths that swarmed the ancient seas when sorrow, Poseidon, earthquake, god, lizard, waded the warm shallows, nibbled palms and flowering magnolias. I, mesquite, whisper these stories to you. Long ago, I dreamt the people and pledged to reveal the fruits of my body, a feast praised by porcupine, dove, and deer. And when the humans appeared, bands of nomads, hungry and clever, their spirits tough as my taproot, I sang to them. Mash my pods into meal for mush and flatbreads. Use the amber gum that seeps from my flesh like blood as a healing balm and a glue to fasten arrow points to shafts whittled from chapote, lithe sister of silver skin and black plums. Use my sharp thorns for needles. Pound my fibers into cloth wind them into cordage. My pale leaves like feathers will offer you refreshing shade and murmur the story of this sacred place along the weave of a river bursting with fish. Sing with me. We will breathe into each other and I will welcome you home. Thank you. And we're all home in this sacred place enjoying the plants of this place together. You can go to the next slide. So I'm going to tell or give another sharing with a tree. Um, every morning when I walk my dog, we pass by a beautiful, large old cottonwood tree, and it will often drop leaves and twigs that I sometimes gather as gifts. Um, on the left, you can see how I've used the leaves with some other local colors to create a little um, picture. But on the right, if you'll look carefully, you'll see some stars in those uh, twigs that I've snapped. And that's because there's a wonderful story that comes from the Plains Indians. The Cheyenne and Arapaho tell this story of cottonwood trees and how the cottonwood fills the sky with stars. All things come from Mother Earth and stars are no exception. They form secretly in the earth and drift along under the soil until they find the roots of the magical cottonwood tree. 
It is said they enter the roots and slowly, slowly work their way up through the trunk into the branches. And finally they come to rest at the small twigs at the end of branches. And there they wait patiently until they are needed. When spirit of the night sky decides that she needs more beautiful stars to light up the sky, she calls on wind spirit to help her. And the spirit of the wind sends gusty wings from all directions. And soon the wind shakes the cottonwood trees so hard that twigs begin to break off. And as each twig breaks, stars are released and even more escape when twigs fall and hit the ground. New stars race up into the night sky, and each one is carefully put into a special place. And when spirit of the night sky sees that there are enough new stars, she asks wind spirit to stop, and wind spirit settles down to a gentle night breeze. Of course, spirit of the night sky wants to thank the wind spirit. And she asks all those new steers, stars to twinkle brightly. And that way wind spirit can see where all the new stars have been placed. So if you want to help add a new star to the night sky, gather some cottonwood twigs that have fallen to the ground. Snap a few, that helps you know if you've got some good ones and then wait for a clear night. And when that night comes, pick a place where you can see some stars. And if you'll snap your twig and hold it up to the night sky, of course, check and make sure that the ends of your twig actually have a star pattern and then lift it to the sky and that star will be released. And they say that the shadow of the star is that little star pattern that you'll see in your cottonwood twig. So I hope that all of you will put some new stars in the sky by gathering some cottonwood twigs that have fallen to the ground. Thank you. Next slide. So the next three stories that I'm going to share actually come from the Plains Comanche um, and they're all wildflower stories. Um, the first one is about Gaylardia which many people use the common name Indian blanket. And there are many different versions of this story that are told, but my favorite tells that there was once a great weaver in a tribe of Plains Comanche. And he was an extraordinary weaver. He would gather roots and wild plants and rocks for minerals to make his own paints. He would um, make his own wool by gathering the fibers and carding them and spinning them. And he made beautiful robes, mats, and blankets. And everyone in his tribe had something that he had made and considered it among their most prized possessions. But the day came one year when the weaver understood that he did not have much time left on earth his life was drawing to an end. And so he set out to make one last weaving that would become his death blanket. He worked for many weeks, gathering the plants for dyes, preparing the wool, carefully setting up his loom, and then spending his last months weaving the blanket. And when it was complete, that night, the weaver lay down and died in his sleep. Out of their deep respect and profound love for the weaver, the people of his tribe wrapped him in the blanket and respectfully placed him on the burial platform. And when the great spirits came to take the weaver to return him to his ancestors, the great spirits marveled at the beauty of the blanket that he had woven. And they also marveled at the love and respect that the tribe so clearly held for this weaver. And so as a gift to the people of the tribe, the great spirits send the colors of the weaver's last weaving to earth every spring in the flowers of the Indian blanket flower. Next slide. 
this story, I'll bet all of you know, um, it became especially well known after the prolific author illustrator Tommy De Paola made a children's book version of it. Um, and so if, if you haven't seen his book, you should, it's, it's quite lovely. Um, this is also a story that uh, is said to come from the Comanche and has been told in a variety of ways over many years. But basically it tells that there was a tribe again of Comanche who were in a time of terrible hardship. Um, it was a time of great drought that brought on great famine and many of the people had died. In fact, there was not any family that did not lose at least one member. There was one small girl who had tragically lost all the members of her family, her parents, her grandparents, her siblings. And she certainly was not alone for the people always cared for all of them. And she was loved and cherished by her people, but her heart grieved for her own family that she had lost. In desperation during this time of drought and famine, the people went to their medicine elders and begged them to ask the great spirits what they might do in order to stop this hardship. And so those elders went up on a hill and for three days and nights, they danced and prayed to the great spirits. And at the end, they came back down the hill and gathered all the people and said, the great spirits have told us what we must do. They require that we must give the greatest possession among us as a gift. And then they sent people back to their homes to consider what this possession must be. As they made their way back to their tents, you could hear people murmuring, surely the great spirits don't mean my, my beautiful blanket or, or my fine pot or, or the new bow I made for myself. But that little girl, who held the last thing she had from her own family, a doll that her mother had sewn from buckskin and had put flowers of the blue jay, the, not flowers, feathers of the blue jay, those blue and white feathers in the doll's hair. And she whispered very softly to the doll and said, I know what the greatest possession is. And that night when all the rest of the people lay sleeping, that little girl clutching her doll and a torch left her sleeping place and walked up the hill. And there she used that torch to build a fire and when it was blazing, she put her head close to the doll she cherished so deeply, thought of the ones that she had lost and then tossed the doll upon the flames and watched as the fire consumed it. She waited until the fire died down and when the ashes were cool enough, she gathered them in her hands and she dispersed them to all the four directions. And then exhausted, she lay down and fell asleep. In the morning, when she awoke and stood up, and looked out over the lands of her people. She was astonished to see that everywhere where ashes had drifted to the ground, there were beautiful blue and white flowers like the feathers of the blue jay that were on the hair of her doll were now growing. And then soft rains began to fall and soon all the land was filled with these beautiful flowers. And it is said that to remember, to commemorate that sacrifice of that little girl whose sacrifice returned the rains and brought good times to the people again. To remember that every spring, the blue bonnets cover the land of Tejas. Next slide. Um, Tommy De Paola also did a children's book about the Indian paintbrush. And so many of you may know this story as well. Um, this legend tells, also Comanche tells, um, that there was once a young boy who more than anything else wanted to become a strong and brave warrior. However, this boy was very small and not as strong and big and 
finely muscled as many of the other boys. And when the bigger boys would go off to practice their skills, he very often was just unable to keep up. And so he wasn't able to be learning the skills that he needed to become a great warrior. And one day feeling really sorry for himself, he just kind of knelt down, was mumbling to himself. And his grandfather came and sat beside him and said, you know, not every person is meant to be a warrior. Our people have need of many gifts and every person has special gifts. I have seen you sometimes drawing and painting the things you see. Perhaps that is your special gift. And the little boy thought about this and decided that perhaps his grandfather was right. And so from that day forward, he practiced drawing and painting everything he saw. When he became a young man and was quite an accomplished painter by this time, he became a obsessed with the idea of capturing the colors of the sunset sky in a painting. And every day he would try to do that. And every day the colors would elude him. He'd get close, but it would never really capture the beauty of the sunset sky. This was very frustrating, but he didn't give up. Every day, every day he would try again. And one night as he lay sleeping, an old man and a young woman came to him in a dream. The young woman was carrying a pure white deer skin and she laid it down beside him and said, this will be the canvas upon which you will capture the beauty of the sunset. And she laid it next to him. The old man leaned in and whispered, go to the hill tomorrow evening, take nothing but the doe skin with you and you will find all you need to capture the sunset. The next morning, the young man awoke and waited all day for evening. And as the sun began to set, he gathered the doe skin and hurried up to the top of the hill. And when he arrived there, he was astonished to find there were paintbrushes dipped in every color of the sunset. He sat down, spread out the deer skin, and using one brush after another, began to paint the sunset that he could see. And as he worked, he would toss each brush aside and gather the next. And by the time the sun had vanished beneath the horizon, he had his painting. He carried it down proudly and presented it to the tribe as his finest gift. And indeed, every spring, when the spring rains come, the great spirits remember this incredible gift that this young man gave through his painting to the people. And that's our Indian paintbrush. Okay, the next slide. Okay, we're actually going to go back to a um, tree and I'm going to tell uh, the Tejas legend of the pecan tree. This is the only slide that I didn't have photographs of my own. I had to find some stock photos. Um, I don't know why I didn't have any great pecan photos, um, but I want to give a little background to this story. There is um, a book called When the Storm God Rides, Tejas and other Indian legends retold by Florence Stratton. She was apparently quite an amazing Renaissance woman. She was a journalist who lived in Beaumont. She died in 1938, but um, she retold these stories that had actually been collected by another woman by the name of Bessie Reed, who was a Texas naturalist and for 40 years traveled around the state. And in, in addition to her collecting specimens as a naturalist, she also collected stories by speaking to uh, native peoples and people who had close relationships with tribal peoples and gathered these stories, which then Florence Stratton collected into a book. And that book, When the Storm God Rides, is still available. You can actually find it online. You can also order it from Amazon and other places. But um, this is one of the stories that I thought was quite charming. And it's called The Pecan Tree's Best Friend. And I'll be honest, I don't 
really often see Orioles. I think I've only seen one once in my own yard. Um, and this story I think comes from East Texas where maybe this is seen more often, but maybe some of you have also seen Orioles hanging out building nests in pecan trees. But it is said that in almost every pecan grove, you will find the little orchard Oriole and his mate living and raising their families in the spring. And this is because one spring a long time ago, there was an Oriole family that was living in a small nest of woven grasses that was swinging at the end of a branch on a tall pecan tree. And the proud father bird and his wife were the parents of five darling little ones. They were not yet feathered out enough to fly, but their tiny feathers were large enough that they could kind of flutter to the edge of the nest and they would look over to see what the world looked like down below. And all day the parents gathered bugs for the little ones and sang their sweet Oriole songs. And the big pecan tree enjoyed the, the Oriole family. Um, they ate the bugs that often tried to bore into the tree's trunk or cut its leaves off. And so the tree considered the birds good neighbors. But one day the father bird looked up and saw that the sky was beginning to fill with what looked like bits of white clouds or snowflakes. And then beneath those clouds flying with great speed, he saw great wide winged birds, frigate birds, which live far away on islands in the Gulf. And he knew that these birds only fly inland when there is a hurricane or a terrible storm that's getting ready to rush out of the Gulf and blow wildly upon the coast country. And knowing this, he became very frightened because he knew that his little ones would be blown out of their nest. Um, there was no way they could survive such a storm. And the tree noticed that this oil was fluttering around in, in great distress and, and said, what is the matter? And the oriole explained that this great storm was coming and would blow his five children away. The pecan tree said, I know just what to do. There's a hole under my biggest branch. Take your wife and babies into that hole and the wind will not be able to touch you. And so the father Oriole did just that. They did not have to wait long before those howling winds swooped into the grove with black clouds and streams of rain. All the trees bent their heads as the wind tore at their trees and branches. But safe in that hole, the Oriole family could listen to the wind howl, but they were safe and sound. Now, after the storm subsided, the father Oriole told the pecan tree that he would do something good to help the tree, just as great as what the tree had done to protect his family. And the pecan tree laughed and said, you're a little bird. What can you do? You already eat bugs. That's enough. No, no, there will come a time when I can do something great for you. And you know, he was right. One winter when the Orioles were down in Mexico where they migrate and live during the winter months, he got a special feeling in his bones, that father Oriole, that a cold north wind was about to come out of the north. But I should tell you that this had been a very unusual winter in Texas. Spring was about due, it should actually arrive any day, but the winter had been unusually warm. There had been very few cold spells. And so now the trees thought that it was so warm that surely it was time for them to start putting out their buds. There, was, there wasn't going to be any more cold north winds. But the little bird could tell that in fact, there was an enormous cold wind out of the north that would soon blow through Texas. And so that little bird left Mexico and flew as fast as he could north to the pecan grove. And there he found his friend and said, don't put out your buds, whatever you do, there's a cold wind on the way. Now the pecan tree found this hard to believe, but he decided to listen to his little bird. And as soon as the Oriole had shared this message, he sped back down to Mexico to escape the cold north winds himself. And sure enough, the very next day, a howling cold blue norther came whooping down and blew across the country and all the trees and bushes that had 
put their early buds off, had their buds frozen. And in fact, that pecan tree was the only one that spring who was able to put out buds and the only tree that bore pecans that year. But when the other pecan trees learned of the good turn that the oral had done for their friend, they decided they too would be friends of all orioles from that time. And it is said that is why you can find the little orchard orioles building their nests in the branches of pecan trees. And if any of you see orioles in any pecan tree, um, let me know. I would love to have that confirmed locally. Um, okay, the next slide. So I'm gonna switch a little bit here and share, it's like a poem, it's actually a song, although I not know how to sing it, I will recite it, that comes from really one of my favorite books uh, by Gary Paul Nabhan. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the ethnobiologist Gary Paul Nabhan, and if not, you want to be. He's really one of my heroes. And this comes from his book called Cross Pollinations, The Marriage of Science and Poetry. Nabhan is himself both a scientist and a poet and has done a, a wonderful job of collecting information about pollinators and the native plants of the Southwest. And in this particular book, um, there's a, a lengthy section about the Datura and its uh, sacred relationship to the Odam people in Arizona, uh, whose language Pima, the Pima language, this song has been sung and recorded. And Gary Paul Nabhan working with tribal friends um, made his own translation of the song. And it actually describes the relationship between the hawk moth and the datura. The hawk moth that uses the datura as a larval host plant and also for nectarine. Um, many of you I'm sure are aware that uh, we consider this a toxic plant, but that it has been used in very special ways by um, shamans of Southwestern tribes in small amounts and in sacred ceremony to induce um, a hallucinogenic state in which a shaman can navigate the shamanic realm. And so this song describes that hallucinogenic state that the hawk moth itself experiences. And here it is, sacred datura, hawk moth song. Stopping for a while in the white of dawn, stopping for a while in the white of dawn, then rising to move through the valley, then rising to move through the valley, remembering when the green of the evening fell away, when the green of the evening falls away. Sacred datura leaves, sacred datura leaves, eating you, I dizzily staggered, drunkenly crawled. Sacred datura blossoms, sacred datura blossoms, drinking your nectar, I dizzily, drunkenly flew away. As I hovered, he pursued me, his bow looming larger, his arrow overtaking me, shooting right through me. My horns were cut off and thrown away. As I was pierced by the arrow, my guts were spilled. I fell from the air until my fluttering was stilled. The horns severed from me had fallen away. They are bugging me now, crazily buzzing. Bugs are swarming, driving me crazy. I'm diving, swooping, my wings tucked away. A night moth drunk on nectar. I'm so drunk on datura nectar. I shudder and flutter till it all goes away. Some people call the datura by the common name Jimson weed. And um, looking at some resources on the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center site, um, in a wonderful, there's a wonderful resource for their um, volunteers that give a lot of legends and lores of native plants. And um, there's a little thing there about Jimson weed. 
And apparently Jimson weed's a corruption of the name Jamestown weed. And it said that a group of English soldiers on the way to Jamestown to put down a rebellion ran short of food. And so they found uh, what looked like fruit on the Jimson weed and they gathered and ate it. And soon those soldiers were hearing noises and seeing things that were not there and apparently hallucinated for an entire week until they ran out of Jimson weed fruit. So be forewarned, um, listening to the Hawk Moth's tale and the Jamestown tale, I, I know I'm not going to be tasting any Datura. Uh, next slide. So the next story is about the Texas dandelion and the left slide does show a Texas dandelion, also known as the false dandelion. And some of you are probably looking at the right-hand side and saying, that's not a dandelion, uh, and may recognize it as the Texas silver puff. I have some of those that have volunteered in my yard and I'm very fond of them. But I did not have a good picture of dandelion fluff from a, a Texas dandelion itself but I did have the picture of the, the similar kind of fluff that the silver puff creates. So the image goes with the story. And this also comes from a tribal legend um, that tells that there was once a beautiful um, chieftain's daughter who fell in love with the sun. And every day she would climb up a hilltop and she would gaze at the sun as he made his transit across the day sky. For years, she adored the sun and followed his transit every day she went to the hill. Every day she called to him and, and hoped he might look at her and speak at her, but he never did. And as time went on, the young woman at last grew to be a very old woman with long silvery white hair. And as she watched her beloved, the sun, her hair began to blow away. Strands of gray and white and silver would blow away on the wind. And one day she lay down on the hilltop and passed away. And only then did the sun take notice. He marveled at her devotion that he had so long ignored. And as a token of his respect and admiration for that devotion, he covered her body with hundreds of small, dainty yellow flowers. And every year, those flowers appear in the spring and summer, and they too track the sun's progress across the sky until they too grow old and their hair as seeds drift away on the wind. And next slide. This is the last story in the nine stories I selected to tell you today. And um, most people I hear calling this uh, very familiar native vine snail seed. It has several different um, common names. And I usually refer to it as the Marhil vine, which is one of its common names. But, but other people have told me, gosh, I, I never heard that. But there is a, a wonderful story that um, explains why there are some people who continue to call this the Marhil vine. Marhil refers to Padre Antonio Marhil, who was a Franciscan priest born in the mid 1600s in Spain and who came in the early 1700s to New Spain. Um, he is said to have always walked barefoot and traveled hundreds of miles throughout Mexico, Texas and Central America. Um, it's said that he helped to found some of the missions um, in East Texas and Louisiana and then when those were destroyed by the French, he came and moved into the San Antonio area and apparently for a year uh, stayed and served at the mission San Antonio de Valero, which later became known as the Alamo. And there are records that show that he had signed records um, recording baptisms and marriages that he had um, 
been the priest for at um, the San Antonio Valero mission. And a lot of legends grew up around him and he is said to have um, been the cause of miracles. And one of those stories concerns the Marjilfein and a little boy who lived in the mission of San Antonio de Valero where Padre Margil was the priest. One year, Padre Margil gathered the families who lived at the mission and asked if they would prepare a gift to offer at the Nacimiento, the nativity scene that had been placed at the altar in the chapel. And the people were excited about this. And so many people, you know, were considering what they might offer. And, you know, some were thinking of a beautiful pot they had made or a lovely woven blanket that the, they might have made or, or maybe a fine bow. Um, and so as people were discussing and, and choosing, selecting what gift that they would bring in the procession to lay uh, at the creche, at the manger of the, this nascimiento, um, there was one little boy who his family had very little and he was, couldn't think of anything that he could offer. And he so wanted to offer a wonderful gift to the baby Jesus um, on uh, El Noche Bueno on Christmas Eve, but he couldn't think of anything. And his mother tried to comfort him and say, no, you can find something, go out and see if, if Mother Earth has some gift that you might offer. And he went for a walk and before long, he did notice this tiny, tiny little baby vine that was just beginning to poke out of the earth. And it was so sweet and so small and humble. It reminded him of himself. And he thought, well, maybe if I carefully dig this up and, and offer it, it will serve as a gift for the baby Jesus is very small himself. He's just a baby. And so he got a little pot from his mother and very carefully he dug up this little vine, careful to get all its roots and put it with a little soil in his pot. And then the evening of Christmas Eve, El Noche Bueno arrived and the people all lined up with their gifts and they processed one by one into the chapel and laid their beautiful gifts before the nacimiento. The little boy was the last in the line. And as he saw these magnificent, colorful, beautiful gifts being laid in front of the manger, he felt more and more ashamed because all he was offering was this tiny little vine that he dug up and he didn't even have to make it. You know, the earth had given it to him. But there he was. And when he got in front of the little manger, he put his little pot kind of trying to hide it behind some of the other things so people wouldn't notice what a, a plain gift he was offering. But then during the service, as people were praying and chanting, people started to whisper and started to point at the nascimento. Look, look, do you see? Do you see what is happening? Milagro, milagro, it's a miracle. And the boy stood up so he could look over other people's heads and he saw that that little vine was growing and putting out new leaves and tendrils and, and it was growing and it was starting to weave around the nascimento and soon all those leaves and, and stems were putting forth beautiful tiny little green white flowers and soon the flowers were turning into berries of the brightest most brilliant red until this vine surrounded the manger like a beautiful blanket or shawl and surrounded all the figures of the nascimento and wound around and made this beautiful little wreath around the baby Jesus. Milagro! Milagro! The people were all standing and shouting now. And even Padre Margil looked and said, Milagro, the little boy's gift has brought a milagro, miracle. And so every year at this time, if you will look for the Margil vine, the snail seed vine that grows everywhere around here and see those bright red berries, you can remember the milagro that happened at the Mission San Antonio de Valero, our Alamo.
long ago. Final slide. So I just wanted to let you know the resources that I gathered these stories from. So there's uh, Gary Paul Nobhan's book for the Datura. Um, a wonderful book is Elizabeth Silverthorne's Legends and Lore of Texas Wildflowers. She's got um, the Mahilvine, her version of the Mahilvine story. I already mentioned Francis Stratton's When the Storm God Rise. Um, and those are Tejas or Cado and other Indian legends. I, it includes, I think, some Comanche and some Mayan. And Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower is great. Uh, in the education department, they've got a wonderful um, packet on legends and folklore. And the Cottonwood legend, you know, I went back and looked at starlab.com and you can't really very easily find it on there. But if you look at the WordPress blog of Wild Lettuce Gal, she has the version that I used. But also if you just Google Cottonwood makes stars or something along those lines, there are many different Plains Indians versions of that. Um, so those were the nine that I chose to tell you this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it. I was really glad for the cold weather because it makes storytelling much cozier. So thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed the stories. Thank you so much, Moby. That was awesome. I loved the stories. Um, I had never heard that about the cottonwood, and I had never seen the star, and I want to go out right now and, and find <laughs> some. <laughs> so I, the visual that that gave was was amazing. So thank you so much, Moby. That was awesome. Um, we do have a question. Somebody is okay. wondering if you... If you know if there are any uh, any stories or uh, about milkweed species, so I also want to find stories about milkweed species, and I have not yet been successful. But I am on a search and a hunt. And if any of you come across something, by all means, share it with our Nipsot chapter, because. The milkweeds are so amazing for so many different reasons. And I have many zizotes that pop up in my neighborhood and I would love to have a, a story um, to attach to them. So the, the search is on. Well, there are a lot of very positive comments. Um, I think everybody was just really enjoying listening to these stories and it's so great to um, I hear those. I hadn't, I didn't know of any of them. And I've got a bunch of notes that I took and I'm going to definitely look up that cross pollinations book that you mentioned. That's oh, it's, really yeah, it's wonderful. It's, it's, it's just an extraordinary book. And if anyone doesn't know Gary Paul Nabhan, um, he's got many books, um, books about um, foods from native plants, pollination. I mean, he, he's just amazing. He's a, wonderful, wonderful ethnobiologist that any native plant person would want to know about. Awesome. I can't wait to, to look this up. Um, and somebody is saying, maybe you can create your own milkweed story, Moby. Yes, I have <laughs> considered that and that may happen. <laughs> well, we look forward to it. And um, I really, I really am. I really enjoyed these stories and I really do love these poems. Um, it, this is a great thing to to be able to sort of get away and get your mind away through these stories and through poetry and um, art and uh, this was just fantastic so thank you so much for thank you uh, presenting for us tonight thank you I enjoyed it and I love our local chapter and I was just glad to be able to offer what I do thank you so much and I don't know, Joan, is there anything else we need to do? Uh, no, not that, not that I can think of, except just tell everyone, I guess we'll see them in the new year. Oh, um, thank you. That's a good this is our last. This is our last <laughs> meeting of 2020. So. <laughs> Dang it. I forgot to mention that. That was actually one, one of the main points I wanted to to make at the beginning. I'm so sorry. Yes, we're going to kind of, you know, uh, not have a lot going on for a couple of months. Um, but we, we will be looking into ways to possibly get some more uh, outreach materials out there and some of our uh, various platforms. Um, maybe we can do some of that in uh, 
November, December. Maybe Moby will write her milkweed story. Ooh, <laughs> that's a challenge. <laughs> I really wish we could all just sit together in a room and just talk about all of this. It's kind of weird in this um, Zoom platform, but this is what we've got. And it's great to, great to see you and great to, to hear uh, your stories. They were amazing. Thanks, Lee. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank Good you so night, much. everybody. Um, yeah, and I guess, and I just would also like to say that I'm pretty sure we'll be continuing this mode of meeting in, um, in January. Um, and actually, we do have a program for January. Uh, the president of the Cactus Society is going to talk about some work um, doing restoration um, in an area in West Texas that lost a lot of their um, people had taken tech, uh, cacti out of this area. So more details on that, but we do plan on maybe getting um, at least one newsletter out um, between now and the end of the year. We'll, we'll take a little bit of a break, but we'll get something out to everyone to know so they know we haven't disappeared. Okay. Sounds good. I guess it's good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. All right. I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. So we'll see you all around. Thanks for coming. Bye bye. Good night.